this video, I'm going to show you three free tools that you can use to fully encrypt your email communications. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Seth Estrada, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make your email communication more private through free and open source encryption using three tools that I think anybody can learn how to use in a very short period of time. First off, special thanks to our sponsor, MindYour.biz. We have Bitcoin and cryptocurrency themed neck gaiters on sale. They're purchasable with cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others that you like, including Monero. OpenPGP, it's a library that's designed for email encryption, it was created way back in 1991, if you can believe that, and then finalized in 1997 as a standard. It has been proven not to be crackable by the NSA. That's right. The NSA in 2014 essentially revealed that they were unable to decrypt PGP encrypted messages. So that makes PGP and now open PGP, the open source version of it, the gold standard as far as email encryption goes. Looking at the email encryption software that's recommended by OpenPGP on openpgp.org, the one common thread across Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, not so much Android and iOS, we'll talk about those on another video or at another time, but across every desktop operating system is Thunderbird, and specifically a couple of plugins for Thunderbird, AutoCrypt and Enigmail. But the latest news is that AutoCrypt and Enigmail are not actually required. The Thunderbird development team has rolled it directly into the product itself. That's why I wanted to start with this particularly awesome piece of software because it's free, it's open source, anybody can download it and use it on any desktop computer. There are so many plugins that it works with, but now you don't even need to add a plugin to be able to encrypt your email end to end. So let's take a look at exactly what that looks like from the desktop. Uh, first off, you need to be able to go down from the menu or check from the menu under help. About Thunderbird 7.8.2 is when this functionality was released. And if you don't have that version, then go ahead and update to the latest version. I'm on 7.8.4, and so it's definitely included. Clicking on the main menu, going down to Tools, click on Tools, and then Open PGP Key Manager. This is where you'll be able to see all the keys that you have created or all the keys that you've imported of your contacts. Now with OpenPGP, it's important for you to know that to send an end-to-end -end encrypted message, you actually need two keys, not just your own. Rather, two sets of keys, not just your own keys. So for yourself, you have a public and a private key. The private key is, of course, just for you. And the public key is for anybody that you want to send messages to. However, if you want to send a message to someone else, you will need their public key as well to be able to send to them in the first place, compose a message and send. I've only just installed this on this installation of Thunderbird for demonstration purposes, so I don't have a, a third party or an additional party's set of keys here. So forgive me for that. I just wanna show you the basic UI so you can get a sense for how this looks. Um, as far as setting up a brand new set of keys, as simple as going down to tools, open PGP, <laughs> open PGP key manager, and then generate keys, new key pair. It's that easy. And then any email addresses that you have installed, I'm gonna go with my Gmail account there. You can choose a key expiration date or decide that it doesn't expire and then decide the type of encryption. Rather than RSA, I've chosen to go with elliptic curve cryptography just because it, it, it will be more robust. It's anticipated that it will outlive the, the 2030s, so to speak whereas RSA encryption might not last that long. That's what I'm reading on the internet. I'm not an expert in cryptography, but this is what I'm finding out as I'm reading on the subject. So any new keys that I'm creating, I'm ensuring that they're elliptic curve cryptography, not RSA. So they have a, a bit longer life. That way I don't have to worry about having them expire or I'm setting them to expire within a time frame that makes sense based on the current state of technology. I can now generate the key. It'll give me a warning that it's going to take a second to make those. Now I've got a, I've got a, a Ryzen processor with 16 cores, so that it happens in no time. And now I've got my keys here. I could hypothetically send something to myself. So we'll go ahead and just do that. Now, if I want to send an encrypted message, simply click on Write, and I have the Compose window that comes up. We'll send it from one that I know has an encryption key, and we'll send it to an email account that I know has an encryption key. Now under security, I drop that down and then require encryption. It's really that easy. Now in the lower right-hand corner of my compose window, 
it tells me that open PGP is activated and there's a little lock. It's really that simple. There we go. <clears throat> nice unnerving use of the first person plural there, but we have a message composed and we should be able to send it now. Et voila. So I'm going to show you from the webmail interface on Gmail as well as from within Thunderbird what that looks like to have that encrypted message come through. While we wait for that, you saw how easy it was to just compose the message, send it, generate new keys. As far as finding the keys of some other person who you want to send email to, you're going to need to request those from the person you're communicating with, or you may need to go to a public key server, something like pgp.net or something like the MIT public PGP key server. There are some sort of directories of people's public PGP keys, and those are listed uh, in the same way that somebody might list a specific phone number for their home, as they used to do in the old white pages, or the way somebody might list a specific phone number for themselves on a bulletin board or a community area of an apartment complex or a homeowners association bulletin board. They may want to put a specific phone number there that people can reach them at, but they may want to keep a phone number private. In that same way, you can have more than one set of keys that you generate within Thunderbird or any other open PGP client. And some can be public, others can be just for certain people who you know, and yeah, they can keep those organized however you want to. Thunderbird makes that very, very easy, as you saw, with the management already built in. Going through the menu to tools, and then to the open PGP key manager, it's just, it's really very simple. Um, as far as importing keys, if somebody wants to send you their open PGP public key as an attachment on some other email, they can send it to you using uh, iMessages. They can send it to you, I think, even via like Facebook Messenger. There's really no wrong way, though you do want to be mindful of the different communication channels that you use to communicate this sort of delicate information. However, the point is that those keys can be sent to you and you can simply import them as a file into Thunderbird. All right, so that's Thunderbird encryption in a nutshell. It's very easy to use. The home site of OpenPGP, what did they recommend? Well, they also recommend some things that are webmail providers and browser plugins. One browser plugin that I think is worth looking at is Mailvelope. And Mailvelope, I'm pretty happy with because of its broad availability. It runs on Chrome or Edge or Brave or Chromium or anything that's based on the Chromium engine by Google, and it runs on Firefox, so it's pretty broadly supported, and you can use it on any desktop computer because of that. It can be OpenBSD, it can be Linux, it can be Mac OS, it can be Windows. Anything that runs a modern web browser can run Mailvelope, and it can encrypt your email from the browser, so you don't have to have a desktop email client running. You can just access your webmail the way you might normally access your webmail. It's open source and it's been audited and it works with so many other webmail providers. This is kind of what convinced me is that it's not just Gmail, but it's also Yahoo. It's also Outlook. Pretty much the biggest players in the email game. They're supported by Mailvelope and they're recommended by OpenPGP. So if you are the sort of person that checks your email online instead of using a desktop client, this might be a better fit for you. Now, as far as using it, it's as simple as downloading and installing a plugin and then logging into that plugin every time you check your webmail. I'm not going to do a full walkthrough of Mailvelope in this video. Just wanted to bring it to your attention that if this is the way that you use email, this might be easier for you. And tool number three, 7-Zip. Now, 7-Zip, you might be saying, well, Seth, 7-Zip isn't even an email application. Plus, it's not technically open PGP. Well, you're right. But it is AES-256 encryption, which is on the list of things that's very difficult for the NSA to deal with. So if you want to make sure your attachments at least are encrypted in a way that no third party can snoop on, I highly recommend you use a tool like 7-Zip. I personally used 7-Zip when I was doing taxes back in 2000, I think 11 and 12, and in every year following when I work with my accountant. So that if I send my accountant any sensitive information, it's always encrypted. Nobody can intercept my sensitive documents when they're being sent to somebody like him. And then I send the password to decrypt it through some other means of communication, not over email. But 
7-Zip is very easy to use. This is the main interface here. I've highlighted Bitcoin right there, the Bitcoin PDF. This is the original Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. I've clicked on add to an archive. And here's a brand new archive, Bitcoin.7z. I could just go with a zip file and that would allow me to do some encryption. The issue is it would go with zip crypto, not AES-256 by default. 7-zip is more aggressive compression, so it's a smaller file size and it will only choose AES-256. Plus, it can encrypt the file names inside of the archive. So if I were encrypting an entire folder, then every one of the file names inside of that folder would be protected via encryption when I use the 7-zip option. It's just a much better option. I can adjust all of the other parameters that you might want to work with. I'm including the number of CPU threads that I have available in my computer. I'm just going to let it rip, give it all the CPU threads. But I can give it a password. I can even show that password here for kicks and giggles. And then I can... Now when I open up my files, I see that I've got these two right here. I've got Bitcoin 7-zip, I've got Bitcoin 2-7-zip right there. They're, they're even smaller than the original Bitcoin PDF by just a little bit, uh, not by much, but they're now encrypted with a password. And if I wanted to ensure that Google cannot read what I'm sending in transit, then I can simply drop this into a brand new email message. Hey, hey. And I can keep that from being read. Let's take a look at this right now. That email that I sent to myself using Thunderbird looks like this. No name, encrypted ASC. And it looks like even the header has been encrypted when I use Thunderbird. That's pretty awesome. Not even ProtonMail does that. So I've got an encrypted header and I've got that encrypted right there. Let's pull Thunderbird back up. And this same account that I have monitored, there it is. I've got the same account monitored right there. And when I click that open, now, because I have the encryption keys here, <laughs> Thunderbird thinks this message is junk mail. Not junk. Yeah. Save my domain reputation. Now I've got this encrypted. And it shows the timestamp of 627. It did not come in right away. It did take a little bit of time. So it's possible that Google was looking at that kind of sideways. Like, hmm, that's an encrypted message. We don't like having our servers used that way. However, the bottom line is... I've got encryption keys, so even with my Gmail account, I can receive encrypted messages like so, and I can still open them up using Thunderbird. I think of the three options that I mentioned before, it really is the strongest. It's the most flexible. It's easy to use if you've got a desktop computer, and it's free. It's free and open source and built in. There's no reason not to use open PGP encryption with anyone who you communicate with regularly who's willing to use it. All right, on option number three, let me just connect all the dots here. I can drop that 7-zip right in here. Oh, blocked for security reasons. Wah! Okay. Well, that definitely tells me that Gmail, uh, that Google, knows that people want to communicate privately. So I think the slowness in receiving this message and the blocking of that other message are a bit of a problem. So you, of course, have to be very cautious. Could be that it's 7-zip. Let's go ahead and try that one more time. Only this time around, I'm going to use zip compression, AES encryption, and I'm going to do a test password here, Nakamoto. And it looks like everything else is, I'll just keep it standard. And okay. And zip file, it accepts just fine. So I can use 7-zip to still use the AES encryption. However, that prevents me from being able to completely keep secret the file names that are within any kind of like file structures. So keep that in mind. There are limitations when using that method on tool number three. I think it's pretty obvious that using the open PGP encryption that's available for free inside of Thunderbird really is the easiest way to get a lot of really robust information sent via email without interference, even from Google, even using Google servers. But here's the bonus bonus round. If you don't want to deal with any of this tracking people's keys, tracking your own key management, then you might want to go with an option like ProtonMail. It's really simple. I don't get paid for making this recommendation. Of course, I don't get paid for making a recommendation on any of these things. The primary difference is that there's a lot more control over the other tools. What ProtonMail does is adds much more convenience. Um, but again, we'll go over ProtonMail and perhaps Mailvelope in a future video. Let me know. Of the three options that I presented to you, Thunderbird, Mailvelope, and 7-Zip, which one are you most likely to use on a regular basis? Are you unlikely to use any of them?
What do you think email encryption should be like in order to get a user like you to start using it more frequently? And what are some reasons that you might use end-to-end -end encryption in your email communication? Thank you again, as always, for watching all the way to the end of the video. You're the reason I make this media. I love your face. I will see you in the next one.